Hello, hello. Hope this works. Yes. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Checking that the sound loops through. Yes, that works. So, welcome uh, to our very first uh, pure online Rust meetup from Zurich. You might be wondering why I'm not always talking to you. That's because I have this setup all over the place. Uh, I have my control station, main monitor, and the camera uh, from the laptop. So how are we going to do this? Uh, as you all have uh, probably seen in the comments on meetup.com or on the lifeestada.ch uh, website, we have a matrix channel. And I will collect together with Danilo all your questions. So one second, will yes. Uh, we have also prepared Jitsi rooms for you. Uh, since we're a little bit uh, short staffed, I would recommend that you start filling room zero after or shortly after um, the the talk if you want to, and then you have. Uh, an opportunity to chat with each other and also see each other. Um, it's the same, the same idea you have, uh, just a browser and it should work. Uh, we tested the solution with Jitsi and we initially wanted to run with it. However, we noticed that after like 20-ish clients, 23-ish clients, especially if some of them have a mobile phone, sorry, some people use mobile phone, then it gets really laggy and uh, messes up the whole configuration. So that's why we decided against it. Um, and now we use this setup. So how do we work? Uh, currently what you're seeing is VLC grabbing my webcam, streaming it all over to the internet to Danilo. He's uh, our operator tonight. Danilo also connects the video signal from uh, Gerhard, our speaker and his slides. And once everything is together, he streams it then to the next uh, network, in this case, Twitch, which when I check back here, our 34, 35, 45 people are already watching, which is very good. Um, sorry for stalling. I was hoping to see some more people since uh, 65 uh, registered for the event. I was hoping for more like 40 people Um, here we go. So, what else? Too many open windows. Just a second, I need to search my notes. Are these my notes? No. These are my notes, yes. Okay, here we go. So now we'll try to switch into the next mode so I can introduce to you Gerhard Breulich. Uh, Danilo, operator, please switch to the Q&A screen. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So as you see, this is uh, Gerhard. He's a computer engineer enthusiast with lots of experience. Can you hear me, Gerhard? Yes, I can hear you. Wonderful. Let's check if the screen... Yes, wonderful. We are all set up. So, as before, um, use the use the matrix chat. I see some questions are coming up already. Uh, it's about the, the rooms. Yeah, I will share the rooms when the talk has started. Uh, perfect. Without further ado, let's see how this holds up. Thank you. Gerhard, please take it away. Thanks, Stefan, for the introduction. And uh, welcome everybody to my talk. So I'm Gary. I am currently um, a research platform developer at SIS, Scientific IT Servi Services at ETH. Um, in my former job, I was employed at um, Sustainable System Solutions, 
And that's where the, the current talk has its origins. So the use case I'm going to show you today is um, a simulation of a downhole heat exchanger. So what is a downhole heat exchanger? I, I have made a picture that for, for those who don't know um, what that is. So um, for later, I quickly give uh, um, some important um, names of, of the things here. So the uh, red um, line going down, um, I, will, I will refer that to the temperature of the sink and the blue, uh, the temperature of, of the fluid, also called brine, which is coming up, um, is, is then the source. Okay, um, so as I said, I was um, employed at Sustainable System Solutions. They were using um, a Pascal written software. EWS, that's the German word, word for um, downhole heat exchanger, Erdwärmesonde. It was developed um, at basically 1997. Um, it is by Huber Energie Technik. Uh, so the goal here was to um, re refactor that software so that it could be used in a um, life cycle analysis software written in Python. So I went there and started to uh, port this uh, code, which was available on in in some PDF at at, at their homepage, and um, I started to write uh, the code in, in, in rewrite the code in Python. So, what should this program do? As an input, um, you give some material pro properties. Uh, the uh, depth of, of pipes going down, um, then you either give um, uh, the temperature uh, in function of the time or you give the power in, in function of the time at the sink. And as an output you should get um, the temperature distribution of the whole soil surrounding uh, the downhole heat exchanger as well also as, as, as the temperature of the brine itself. And then, um, you, uh, of course, you also want to have um, the temperature of, of the things coming up again, and uh, also the power you can drain from, from the whole thing. So how is, this, uh, how is the numerics of the software done? So, of course, you need some uh, discretization of, of the parts. And here you can see a, a quick overview of, of, of the whole thing. And it, uh, the, the region is divided in um, basically three main domains. The innermost domain is the pipes going down and coming up, the gray uh, pipes you see here. Then a little bit, uh, an, an outer cylinder um, composed of um, some shells of soil, as you can see, these circles you can see here. And then the outer part is, is, is just an outer region. And um, the simulation is, is really done like this. You have um, also three time scales. Uh, the, uh, on, on the highest frequency, the uh, the pipes in the middle will be refreshed and computed. And after some um, repetition, some, some iteration of that, you go uh, one step to the out, outer part, to, to the earth cylinder, and then you, you recompute the temperatures in, in there. And um, as a final step, you then, uh, you can compute how much energy you, you uh, uh, drained from, from these pipes. And with the aid of the heat equation, you can then um, uh, compute uh, the temperature at the boundary, which is then uh, represented by this outer region here. And all, as you can see, the, uh, the um, uh, single parts are subdivided. So the pipe is, uh, as you, in this example, is divided into three axial parts. 
and so is also the earth the the uh, soil layers um and then you also have a uh, radial um uh, division into into also three parts here okay and most importantly you also can see ferris the crab here yeah. <laughs> good um so here is the is uh um you can, you can see the original pascal code as you can see it looks like a little bit spaghetti there are, um a lot of uh different things which go together in one big function they they have a distinction whether it is a coaxial coaxial um uh, downhole uh, exchanger or 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 not and then they have another um case distinction if if you want to compute stationary or you want to compute dynamic so yeah it took quite a time to refactor all that code and it went into this uh, python core co here you can see here this one being all only the um dynamic computation part and i will in this talk i will focus on this part here of this code what you can see here is so even though i used numpy i still have some for loops in here and uh, basically these for loops killed my performance so my code was a lot slower than the original pascal code um really so i mean it felt like uh, my cpu of, uh, of, after three days of uh, painful computing my cpu died but <laughs> no joking um it it just took uh, ages to compute and uh, numpy, numpy is not to blame here it's just these four loops which i um uh, didn't vectorize out here so i thought about how so how can i uh, increase the performance and i was thinking um how can i uh, vectorize out these four loops um so let's see uh, let's have a look at the structure of the innermost for loop the innermost for loop uh, does the following so you have you have basically um if you remember this picture with the pipes going down and up um what you see here this ti represent the temperatures of the uh, single segments of the pipes and then to go from one time step to the next um the prime denotes the next time step so you have to comp you have to basically uh, do such a computation so your new temperature at some position in the pipe depends on the position above and also at the temperature it has been before at, at the same position okay um so um if you have a look at at all this numpy and scipy uh, functionality i simply didn't find um some uh some function which would to uh, solve so, such a recursively defined sequence but what you can do with scipy is you can uh, you can see that uh, the above system of equations can be rewritten in this matrix uh, equation here where you basically have the left hand side is a matrix a times a vector t prime comp uh, uh, which which contains all the components ti and the right hand side is just a, another vector which is uh, which depends on the previous vector t so and the funny thing here is this matrix is just by by diagonal so um you have to solve a bit diagonal matrix system this that means you have you have um order n instead of order n square when you have an ordinary matrix matrix which is not sparse then you then it costs you um n square uh computations when if n is the size of the matrix here if, if it's diagonal you only have order n so that's that's nice so we could 
we could um, vectorize the inner for loop like this, but still we have the outer for loop. And the second for the second for loop, if you um, um, have a look at the code, then you see it's just a rep simple repetition, a, a number of iterations. And then you, of, of, you can apply this matrix several times and times if you want. You can um, then exchange the exponents and then you uh, will see you just have to solve a lower uh, diagonal matrix system. So, OK, so we would in, in in this way we would have um, vectorized the for loops and even unrolled the second uh, for loop um, but still um, uh, I mean I, I started to do that and it just was uh, very error prone and uh, not very funny so what I did is I decided to move to a C extension because then you don't have to do these uh, matrix uh, operations and uh, this unrolling of the loop. You just, you just can port the code. And I did that. This is the C core code, which does. Um, sorry. Okay, I didn't show something um, with my mouse uh, until now, but okay, if you want. Um, um, I just wanted to, to show you this uh, C code here, how it looks like. Um, it's not that, uh, not that much bigger. Um, uh, what you gain is a lot of uh, performance improvement and uh, but the next problem is um, the segmentation faults I had to deal with all these memory errors so the f the nasty thing about them is you don't notice them uh, when you're compiling it's only later when you run your program and uh, it crashes all the time and then you have to debug everything and of course that annoyed me a lot so I thought let's try rust with together with pi03 because the goal still was in the end to run the whole code um, within python good so this is the rust core now um it has basically the same amount of uh, of code as the c function here the core core uh, c functionality um but when it comes to uh, the interface to Python, you see that you can half the size of the code, also just the extension part, not, not the numeric part, and you have ne near C performance. And of course, you have um, Rust developing experience without uh, these nasty sec faults. And as a as a remark here, you still of, of course you still can have some indexing errors. I mean, if you if you write uh, uh, numerics and you are using integer integer for loops, and you run um, over the um, last element, then um, Rust still panics. But um, at least this really nasty to debug. Uh, uh, memory errors w went went away so i was very happy with that um before i come to the benchmarks which i want to show you um, a comparison on my own laptop here i want to show you um such what 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 an output is like so we basically run over one year i gave some input the input was is basically the yellow um part in the bottom um on the left hand side you can't see it very well because it's it's um turning on and off uh, so so frequently that um um i had i also provide a right hand side where you can uh, we have a zoomed view into some part of the left hand side what you see here is the temperature at the sink and the, at, at the source of of this downhole heat and exchanger and um, at the same time, you see when power is drained 
and when uh, the uh, downhole heat ex exchanger is, is turned off. Good. So I, I uh, did the focus on the innermost for loop. So I raised this number of iterations to 100 so that I really, um, I, I really am bench benchmarking here the innermost for loop. And what comes out here is, um, as I said before, this Python extension with the for loops is just taking ages. And the C is much more faster, uh, but but um, uh, Rust is very close to C. I also show you here um, the options uh, used for compiling this thing uh, for C and for uh, uh, Rust. And now I um, I wanted to a little bit tune rust and uh, have a look what i can get out of rust so i thought about optimizing this innermost for loop a little bit and so basically what i did is like what i had before is um i had this for loop in in which i every time access the ith element and um the uh, preceding element as well and then I thought, well, what, what if I cache um, this the one of, of those so that I don't have to access two um, elements of the same array every time? So put it basically into the register. I did um, the thing you see in the lower part. Um, yes, well, um, this did something. Um, uh, I could... Uh, Go down with the with the Rust code to the same amount of time the C extension used to have before. Um, but C also improved a little bit. I, I, I mean, I, I, I backported that to C to to be to have a fair um, a benchmark here, and also C went a little bit down. But but here my, I I I see that the two Rust and C they come come closer together. So the, uh, if the if if the difference before was um, uh, basically 0.4 uh, seconds, it's only 0.2 seconds now. Um, it seems like the two uh, the running running times uh, converge together. Um, uh, my interpretation here is uh, that uh, Rust is still. Um, uh, a young programming language and is not that well optimized as C is. And let's see what happens here. Okay. So this um, was my first part. The second part is I, I want to go a little bit into detail of the Pi03. So I, I just, in the first, first part I, I I talked a little bit about the new numerics, and here I want to talk a little bit uh, um, about the um, interface between Python and Rust. And uh, what you can see here is a um, very simple, small example where I simply do a matrix multiplication, and I'm using PyO3 to make it accessible to Python. So um, I mean, this code is not that that uh, that much. And the most important part is the lines uh, five to line eight. As you can see here, I just put some um, so-called Rust macro in front of the function, and then Rust does something. It it rewrites this function and. Um, he, it, it basically writes for you all the boilerplate code which you have to do by hand in C. For example, uh, the above pi module macro, what it does, it, it creates a Python module for you out of this function. And this function has to have some uh, special signature that it works. And the, uh, the inner macro, the pi fn, this will um, provide some uh, Python function inside that module here called matrix multiplication. As you can see here, 
um, this matrix multiplication, w w it, it takes uh, rust objects and this um, decorator, this, sorry, this uh, ma rust macro will convert these rust types into the corresponding Python types. And what you also can see here at um, line number one, I'm using a NumPy extension to PyO3, so this is available. I I just can take a NumPy array from Python and convert it uh, to a Py array object, which is a Rust object. And I can use this this Py array um, object like a um, Rust list or uh, an array. Okay, then uh, this matrix multiplication function returns some a pi result. Either it succeeds or it raises an error on the Python side, an exception, I'm sorry. And yeah, all, all the thing is done automatically for you. Um, this simple example, by the way, um, is a, I, I made this available on, um, on Git. I will, in the last slide, uh, we will see a link to it. So to compile, what, what, have, do you do, what do you have to do to compile this example? You just run um, cargo build, as you would do it for an for ordinary uh, Rust project. You can also specify release if you want uh, optimizations. And then all you have to do is you have to copy or m move the resulting um, uh, binary, the library, into the folder you want to run the Python code or to your Python path, library path, and uh, it, it, you have to give it a, s a certain name. Um, the name has to be exactly the, the same as you name your function here, pyo3mm. Um, then you can run Python within with uh, Rust, which is Rust powered. How would you do that in Python? Um, you just would um, import this pyo 3 mm which, which is this uh, uh, library. And then you can call uh, this, uh, uh, this matrix multiplication function and you can compare it to the built-in NumPy method. As you can see, I mean, here I have to call a, 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 a function and um, NumPy provides you this nice um, add operator which does matrix multiplication just by using this operator, but still, um, you can see if you run if you will run this code um, that the same thing um, pops out in both cases. And you can what you also can see is um, that um, your Rust code will also rise the correct exception when if you try to multiply matrices with which, which, which non-matching shapes. Okay. So what else can you do with PyO3? You can uh, define custom Python types. I'm, I put a um, remark here, it's version 0.8 only here. Um, in the uh, recent, most recent release, 0.9, um, uh, the syntax would look a little bit more simpler. But for my project, I was using the version 0.8 um, because this NumPy module was using 0.8 until very recently. So the next thing I will do with my project is to build, uh, I will migrate it to 0.9. So, but anyway, here you can see um, how you define a new Python type using just um, Rust. Um, uh, you just uh, de declare an um, ordinary Rust struct here. In this example, it contains uh, just a float. And then you also give uh, you, you apply a um, Rust mac macro on it, the Py class macro, and this one will define all the boilerplate codes for you. That's so that Python knows what to do with this. And what I also have to do is I, um, if I want Python to be able to instantiate such an object, I have to provide my own new function, as you can see here with the new macro. 
and this uh, in just injects um, from from the Python code this this uh, Python float into my Rust object, and then I can work with uh, my Rust object as it was just de declared as above with this struct declaration here. And the last thing I I have to do with this thing is I have to add it to my module. And uh, that is the third last uh, uh, row, uh, third last line here, m add class. And then you can use it. Then you can also, I, I, I mean, as you can see, the um, PyO3 uh, does automatically um, uh, conversion for you from Python objects to Rust objects and the other way um, also. And if for some reason some object does not support this, you can um, implement the from Py object trait. In this example, I'm um, implementing this trait for for the. Uh, oh, by the way, this I think this this uh, this wouldn't go here. My 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 snippet wouldn't go because you are you you want you, here you want to try to implement the from pi object uh, trait which is is coming from another uh, crate to some um, built-in type t uh, the, an, an array of fixed size five which is not possible because you can't you can't um, uh, you you can't uh, implement a foreign trait to a foreign type either the trait has to be in your crate defined in your crate or the type has to be defined in your crate but still this shows you um, how you would do it if if for if from pi object would be defined inside the crate um, the funny thing is um, pio3 provides you already with um, automatic uh, conversion from tuples as you can see here this five tuple here so I can use that to define it on on fixed size arrays, and of course uh, they they noticed that. And in the release 0.9, the above code you see here is already included in in the library. Well, so did the uh, this is um, basically my first overview of Pio3. Um, now, when you develop some code, you finally also want to release it. And here, um, the most modern approach here seems not to be the um, setup tools. So there is some plugins, um, Pio3 setup tools, but um, uh, this seems uh, this 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 uh, this tool maturing uh, maturing uh, seems to be preferred now. You can install it with Cargo, or you can also can install it with pip. There is also a Python package providing wrapping basically wrapping this 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 Rust object. What your um, a project has to look like is you just make your project folder, you define your usual cargo toml. Within the cargo toml you specify the metadata which would usually be in your setup pi. And uh, then you put your Python, if you have a mixed project, you put your Python code in a package um, uh, my project inset with, with, with the underline. And you have your, your usual, usual stuff readme. And then the Rust code, code goes into the directory src. And this is a convention used by Matrix. And then if you have that, you can just do Matrix build, publish, or develop. Build would build it, publish would, it, would push it directly to PyPI. Py and develop would um, build it and uh, put it in your virtual environment. There is no such thing at the moment like setup tools, build X uh, in place, uh, when, if, which you are used uh, for, for th when, when you develop C uh, extensions. Okay, uh, these two maturing. So my my impression from uh, Pio3 is it is still in heavy development. Some things are confusing, especially for me. 
you have basically two Rust types uh, for object, for the Python object. Um, it, there is pi any and there is pi object. And uh, I mean, I, I still don't know, I still always have to think when to use which one of the two. And then also you you have this you have uh, some strange different handling for uh, things which which are very the same thing. I mean, if you want to to extract items from a dict or extract item from an object, um, this sounds very similar to me. Still here you have in the in the one case if you want to extract something from uh, from a dict, this is the first case. Uh, the, you, you only need these three lines here to or these, or these two lines within the function and when you want to get something out of a Python object then you have to acquire this uh, global interpreter log of Python uh, get the object out and, uh, and convert it uh, so I just didn't know why, 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 why those two things behave so, so in such a different way but still, I mean, Bio3 is very cool, I think, because uh, I just had to write half the code I would have to use in C. And uh, I also have some ideas which, which, which were con one could improve here. I mean, as you saw, um, Bio3 uh, already provides some macros, but it would be very cool to not um, have to uh, manually uh, implement this uh, to pi object trade all the time so it would be cool to have something like um, a macro data class or something which automatically writes also for you a constructor for 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 some pi for for some rust struct you define so there's just one macro and uh, and you're done um there are already such things available at GitHub. In this example um, here, which, I, which you see here, you can um, automatically let you write um, um, a dict derive, meaning you, you write a struct, a Rust struct, you um, use their uh, macro and it will write to you um, a converter which will turn a, a properly structured Python dict into your Rust struct. So that's already very nice. And okay, the other thing, maybe is a crazy idea, is um, use DC, the deserialized thread from, um, from Certe um, for, this, for this library, um, because this is um, very broadly used. And if you if you have something which uh, already implements deserialize, it would be fun to just could um, PIO3 uh, use that and co let the conversion doing uh, via this deserialization. I mean, I'm, I'm not the only one having this idea. Um, the link here shows you some other people discussing about this idea. Okay. This is basically it, what I have to say for today. And here you have the links. Uh, the, the first thing I show here is, is my simple PIO3 demo with the matrix, matrix multiplication. Uh, then the slides um, I showed to you here are available at the second link and the downhole uh, heat exchanger simulation is the last link. Thanks very much. I give back to Stefan. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, everybody. So we have a short delay uh, after everything is synced up. Thing? Yeah, I think we have catched up. Gary, can you hear me on the direct line? Yes. Wonderful. So what we did, uh, first, thank you very much. Um, so we are having a faster connection between the two of us because the round trip over Twitch is like 10 seconds. Whew, <coughs> intense, wasn't it? How are you? Um, well, 
Well, I'm a little bit exhausted, but but fine. Wonderful. Uh, okay, uh, let's let's dig in. Let's go with some easy questions. Let's start with uh, with mine. Do you want to uh, give back to me now that I can read the question? Yeah, I will move the questions up and down for you to prioritize what uh, we should do first. So um, a bidiagonal matrix, is it always square? If you want, so um, I, I quickly repeat the question from Stefan, um, a bidiagonal matrix system, um, if you want to solve it, it al always has to be basically square. I mean, you can have overdetermined systems or so, but in this, uh, uh, usually you are talking about a square matrix system, yes. Because mm -hmm. you have the input and output are the same size. Okay, um, that leads us to the next question, um, which is about linearization. So the question was, do you need to have an array to linearize uh, memory operations on top of it? Which, if I remember correctly from, from university, if you have two matrices and then rotate one, then you have linear access over both of them to do your multiplication. Is that correct or did you do any other optimizations to linearize? Mm. Okay, so the question I think uh, Stefan is asking is um, you have um, your array in some memory view, so it's a contiguous um, alignment of all these uh, uh, floats. And if you, uh, I mean, I think St Stefan is is telling that um, if you go um, step by step, one element by one element, you are faster than if you jump from one row to the next row, because that means you have to jump a little bit in the memory, which which. Uh, which costs you time and the optimization I did before was not about that uh, the optimization I showed you before was just uh, I, 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 I went sequentially um, within the array from one element to the next but in each iteration I still access the previous one together with the actual one and I stored the previous one into a register so that I didn't have to go one back again and c just c uh, just to use um, just to use the next one and of course it is important to transpose your matrix matrices accordingly if you 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 always want to have um, you always want to have the rows there where you do dot product products you don't want to do a dot product with with some um, column of a matrix because then you would need to jump from one row to the next one. Does that answer your question? I think more or less yes. Uh, Musu Robin asked the question on matrix. Uh, I think I think yes. If not, um, Musu should quickly say so in the in the matrix chat so do you want me to go over the question here I think we'll go on with uh, question number four now yes number four so let me uh, um, read this question so uh, here someone is asking oh, um, by the way, about the uh, choice of could you zoom in on the code EMD please so people yeah. can read uh, with us. So question number four, somebody is, is asking um, about the choice of Python. Um, he asked if, if I would restart this project from scratch, uh, would I still use Python? And the answer is um, yes, because the people at um, Sustainable System Solutions, they are required to run Python there, and they also can't use any other language because they, yeah, they are, they are focused on very other things and can't learn new languages so fast. 
Um, still, I mean, Python, I, I like Python. I think um, it, it is the language where you really need very uh, few lines of code to do the same things as in, in other uh, languages. So, I mean, but by, of course, I also love Rust. And I mean, if I, if I had the personal choice, I think I would write the whole application in Rust. Cool. Wonderful. Okay, then um, number five, question number, number five, five is somebody is asking if I tried some just in time uh, uh, s uh, based solutions like PyPy and Numba. And um, Numba is, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I see. Um, I, I know about these solutions. Um, I also was thinking about using them. Um, I didn't use them because um, my my thoughts were, were before I'm going for Cython, NumPy, number pi, pi, pi or something like that. So PyPy pi maybe, but Numba and uh, and Cython would be some um, domain specific languages which would bind me to the Python um, environment whereas if i switch to c and um, rust i c also could use uh, the code base for s as a library for other projects we which don't have to be uh, python uh, based i mean uh, of course there are some ways to also bind python code into other languages but um, still uh, I just wanted, uh, 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 one reason was I just wanted to learn Rust, the second reason I wanted to be native and uh, uh, flexible. So the answer is um, I didn't, I didn't try PyPy number and also not Cython. Good. Good, then question number six. Um, did I try using Rust with the target CPU native option? Um, no, didn't, didn't know about uh, this option. Thank you very much. I will try that and yeah. Oh, uh, question number six. Uh, number seven, quarantine beard. No, style beard. <laughs> well, I've gone the lazy route, so yeah, you have to forgive me. So, yes, I think we're done with all the questions. I haven't seen any other questions. Quickly checking meetup.com. Doesn't look like it. Wonderful. So, um, if you don't mind, I would do a quick summary of, uh, of our experience today. It was very pleasant for me. I hope you enjoyed it too. Of uh, after this we can try to join room zero. Uh, currently there are two people in it, me and someone else. If you want to stick around, the, the Jitsi rooms are open for uh, a longer time uh, so in the sense that we don't moderate them. Uh, someone just joined. Okay, to mute this. Wonderful. Um, quick feedback would be appreciated. Um, did you like this kind of event? Um, would you uh, have some feedback for us? We try to minimize the delay uh, as much as possible. Um, I hope that worked somehow. We also try to include the mouse pointer next time. Um, yeah, and I think with that we will close. Thank you Danilo very much for being our operator and uh, streaming center. Thank you Gerhard for presenting, it's very interesting. Um, next step will be we try to scrape the video from Twitch and then upload it after some minor edits to the official Rust YouTube channel. And uh, if you want to present now is, is kind of a great time because you don't have to travel. So you can present, for instance, from Sweden or from anywhere else. 
and we can make a meetup all together. Quick info for Rust Fest uh, showing here the, the, the shirt. <coughs> so we're planning the next Rust Fest. We don't know how it goes, but we'll most definitely have the event in fall. However, we don't know yet. So we're currently looking into options if we can make uh, remote talks like this, or if we find a better solution, we're testing software right now. Uh, we'll, we'll keep you updated on that. But we'll try to make an event happening this year. If we cannot do it in person, we might do a half and half, like half remote, half in person conference, or a full remote conference. We don't know yet, but we'll We'll see how that goes. Um, okay, I've seen some feedback on the matrix. So apparently people don't see many in room zero. So I will rejoin the room. So now I see six people. If you can't see people in the room right now, then um, Sadly, I have to recommend Chrome right now, or Chromium if you're on Linux, because with Firefox, sometimes the video breaks. Um, wonderful. I think that's it. I will now switch over to the, the other machine that runs my uh, Jitsi session. Thank you very much. And hope to see you around. Thank you. See you around.